right, well, I'm Mitch Glazer, and it's a joy to be here with you to talk about probably one of my uh, least pleasant subjects. And, uh, but I chose it. <laughs> and so uh, I, I'm looking forward to the discussion. And uh, we might wait uh, to the end for questions. We'll see what the mood is. Uh, but I don't mind having it a little bit interactive since it is a workshop. So I'll do that. And there we go. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for your love and goodness. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, explore this uh, topic and the impact of the topic of supersessionism and replacement theology on your work in reaching your people for your son. In Yeshua's name. Amen. Now, um, I'm going to do this in, in a couple of different ways. I mean, if you were here for Craig Blazing's uh, lecture this morning, then uh, you've already had pure brilliance, which I could not produce anyway, so it's a good thing it was done. So uh, Dr. Blazing was just fantastic and uh, really expressed it. Uh, from a, a more of a overarching theological perspective, where supersessionism falls uh, in the theological discussion, and what he did that was really terrific was give an alternative uh, uh, on kingdom theology, at least that's what he's named. He's progressed beyond progressive dispensationalism. And so on kingdom theology, which is pretty good. Now we have formed a group, which you can pray for, that met all day on Monday, to actually talk about ways to not counter, not strike back, but to just rebalance the church when it comes to leaving Israel out of the biblical narrative. And there were some pretty heavy hitters on this uh, committee. And we intend to hope, hopefully keep this going. And uh, we've done some interesting things already, Chosen People did, and we're bringing that to the table. Uh, we actually did a very high-powered, thorough, detailed survey. Actually, we didn't do it. Lifeway Research did it. Lifeway Research is the research department of the Southern Baptist, but they go beyond Southern Baptist concerns. And we asked the question, what, two questions, what do millennials think about the nation of Israel and Israel's role in the plan of God? And then secondly, how does that role differ from that of their evangelical parents? So has there been a shift? Now, a lot of people say, oh, my, you know, the sky's falling. There is a huge shift. And you know, pretty soon, you know, nobody, nobody in the church is going to think Israel has anything to do with God's plan. It's not so bad. Uh, we can't release everything yet. But I will tell you one thing that actually was incredibly encouraging, besides the fact that we were right. I mean, that was, that's always pleasant. <laughs> Even when you don't want to be right, it's good to be right. So there is definitely a, a decline, uh, the, generation by generation, because we, we asked age. And so by generation by generation, there is definitely a decline in the, uh, a positive view towards Israel, uh, politically, sociologically, historically, and a growing negative view on Israel's role biblically and theologically. So on both counts, we're definitely going down. But I wouldn't say the slope is as slippery because most of the non-yes responses were not strong negatives, but rather I don't know. Now, to me, that's an opportunity. And so if somebody asked me, based upon a cursory reading of this very extensive survey, 20, two, over 2,000 participants, it takes 20 minutes to do the survey. It's really thorough. And so if, if you ask me, you know, what, at the end of it, what's the opportunity? The opportunity really is with the I don't knows. And what's also curious to me is to see that, number one, if the pastors are not millennials, then people are not really buying in to what their pastors believe. So that's, that's, that's important, especially when you're doing a conference like we're doing at a school like this, where we can talk openly and honestly with the pastors about how they, what they believe about the, this topic. We might do a whole follow-up survey for pastors, but what do they believe on it about the role of Israel in the plan of God, and how are they going to teach it, and all of these things, because obviously not, if they believe it, something's not getting across. And I'm talking about 
the pastors in the 50 to 65 year old range. Now, the interesting thing for me, of course, since I raised two millennials who are still millennials, one's a cusper, one's a real millennial, uh, the interesting thing is, is that some of, a lot of the pastors are millennials. And even more so, a lot of the professors are millennials now. And so, you know, they are unsure. And, and, and they are. They are unsure. I, I talked to some of the young faculty. They're not, they're not totally sure. They're open. And, uh, and so we have a lot of work to do, but mostly among our younger generation. So I'm going to define supersessionism, but first we're going to do an exercise. So open your Bibles to the second chapter of Isaiah. Most of the impact of supersessionism biblically is in the Old Testament and theologically in the New Testament. Because in the Old Testament, there's not, well, there's just not a lot of discussion about how the Old Testament is fulfilled in the Old Testament. Get what I mean? It would not be a discussion. Unless you want a fancy hermeneutical word, don't get too excited about it. It's intertextuality. There is such a concept. And you see that, for example, with Jeremiah and, um, and with Daniel. And uh, Jeremiah predicted it. Daniel talked about it. They'd be in captivity, the Jewish people, for 70 years. Remember that part? Okay. That is intertextuality. That is an uh, Old Testament prophet quoting another Old Testament prophet as a prophecy fulfilled. Okay. There are instances of that. Uh, but, you know, not a huge number. Uh, most of the problems come in in the New Testament because of the ways in which the New Testament writers use the Old Testament. And then that is where most of the supersessionist replacement theology, we'll define in a moment, thinking happens. So what I want to do is uh, just look at Isaiah chapter 2, and uh, we're just going to do a little exposition, have a little fun. Okay? And uh, if you like the Bible, if not, you might want to leave now. That's like, you know, when you get on the plane, they say if you're not going to New York, you might want to get off the plane now. So if you don't like the Bible, you probably will not like this. Okay, so I'm looking at Isaiah chapter 2 at verse 1. And again, this is just an exercise. So the word which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now, if I just had an English Bible, boy, that would really confuse the daylights out of me because it's the word, Davar, which... The son of Amos saw, and it's the word to see. And so, how do you see a word? Well, uh, the Hebrew word for saw there is not the average word. It could mean that he experienced it. That I throw in for free. Okay, verse 2. Now it will come about in the, that in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains, and will be raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. All righty. So now, uh, let's interpret this. Okay? And so, it, this uh, word that Isaiah sees takes place in the last days. Okay? So, in your opinion, when are the last days? If you are a seminary professor, please do not answer this this, you should know that, but when are, when are the last days? We're in the last days. All right, everybody think we're in the last days? Okay, so how long have the last days been, been, been going? Since Yom Shavu. Okay, so, so the last days have been going since the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2, and Peter got up and quoted from Joel chapter 2 in Acts chapter 2 and said, this is what the prophet said would happen, okay? So in the last days, all these things will happen. Okay, I can accept that. Uh, now, which part of the last days are we in? We, we don't know. Some people say latter part of the church age. You know, Are we in the last part of the last days, the middle part of the last days? Are we still in the early part of the last days? That would be so disappointing. You know. Okay. All right, so, okay, so we're agnostic about it. So uh, 
We don't know, but we know that when Yeshua rose from the dead, poured out his Holy Spirit, and Peter got up and said, these are the last days. Um, okay, uh, we don't know what part of the last days are, but just a, a curious question. Uh, when do you think Peter and the disciples thought Jesus would actually return? Immediately. Immediately. Okay, so this is getting long in the two. Okay. So in the last days, so we're not sure what part of the last days this is going to happen in, but we have a feeling from the rest of the text that the last days Isaiah is referring to are not these last days, but maybe the last days when sort of we're in the kingdom. Because as you look at this description, I think you'll see that. And so in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. Okay, well, let's interpret that literally. So the mountain of the house of the Lord, okay, well, we know that the temple was built on Mount Moriah, right? In the, that mountain range. Will be established as the chief of the mountains. So anybody been to Israel recently? Okay. Okay. Did you see that as coming to pass right now? I mean, I saw at least two mosques that probably need to be moved. Okay, so has this happened yet? I, 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 I don't think so. Okay, um, it would have been harder to make that determination if you were a Christian living in uh, 18th century Poland. Okay, it's because you couldn't have, you know, you couldn't have seen these things. We have a great advantage and will be raised above the hills, and all the nations will stream to it. What do you think? See all the nations streaming to the mountain of the house of the Lord? Okay. One of the amazing things we did in our survey, and I'm trying not to leak too much, but I'm too excited about it, so, so please don't tweet this out. Somebody already tweeted it, but don't tweet it out. So, uh, so what we discovered in our surveys, and it was a very good sampling. We, did what, we, we got the best sampling people in the world to do this. Okay? And what we found out is 97% of evangelicals have not been to Israel. So if you're a tour operator, you've got a lot of market potential. Okay? So 97%. So all the nations will stream to it. Now, if, if the believers haven't streamed there yet, then, then you, can, you can bet most people haven't streamed there yet. Okay, I mean, I, I'm there a lot, and I see all the different tourists and so on. But, you know, it, if you want to go up to the Temple Mount, you know, it's a long line. I saw you on the line there, remember, Jerry? It's a, it's a long line. You know, it's not open all the time. And, you know, the Waka Testi, you know, and uh, Jordan's running it. Okay, so whatever is going to be, I don't think has happened yet, Right? Verse 3, and many people will come and say, come let us go to the mountain of the house of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. Whoa, you know, when, when that phrase is used, house of the God of Jacob, the Hebrew word bite, that's a reference to the temple. I don't know how to tell you this. So people always ask me, do you believe that a literal, a, a, a literal temple will be built in the kingdom? If I can use the word millennium, that would be helpful. But if not, I'll just say kingdom. So do I actually believe that a temple will be rebuilt in the kingdom? Now, some people are really excited about the rebuilding of the temple. How many of you are excited about that? Okay, yeah. You know, that's where the Antichrist is going to sit. Okay, so I, I, I don't know what's exciting about this next temple. Okay. Okay, so try not to be too excited. But I'm really excited about the one after that. Okay, because the one after that is going to be the one for the house of the God of Jacob. Now, I understand that Ezekiel 40 through 48 is not the easiest bunch of chapters to interpret. It's apocalyptic language. It's, you know, and, uh, you know, I had a, a certain kind of uh, background uh, before I became a believer. So I have a different way of re relating to Ezekiel 40 through 48 through kind of a drug haze, you know what I mean? And, <laughs> And I saw some things like that before I was saved, um, but not with my eyes, it was in my head, you know. 
And, but Ezekiel 40 through 48 is difficult, difficult. But you know, one of the things about apocalyptic language is it has a physical reality to it. If, if you read the book of Revelation and said it's all apocalyptic language, what, do you, are you going to go to heaven? What, I mean, just because you don't believe the streets are literally paved with gold, you know, it, it might, may not be that exactly, but it has a physical reality to it, doesn't it? You know, when I was in a uh, young pup in Bible college, one of my uh, professors was talking about, we were in the ca- class of the book of Revelation, and he told, you know, there was this pretty graphic description of hell, and it wasn't Dante's, and uh, it was John's, and he was going through it, and I was a believer for seven months. They should never have let me into Bible college. And so I raised my hand, and I said, do you really believe that there's going to be a lake of fire? And people are going to be, I mean, and I was confusing Dante with John, and because I was a new believer. I said, you really believe all that stuff? Is it really going to be that bad? He said, well, it's going to be worse. But that's the worst description that John could give. That was John's idea of the worst thing that could happen. So when I look at apocalyptic language and I'm reading through the scripture, whether it be Ezekiel or Revelation or anywhere else in the Old Testament, I might see a lot of symbols and a lot of things happening that you know, are not easy to explain, but that doesn't mean at the core of it doesn't have some type of physical reality. Think about that. So I do believe the temple will stand, and uh, uh, let me keep going. And he says uh, that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths, for the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And I have to add to that, Isaiah, you mean in potentiality, don't you? Okay? Yes, the Bible has come forth from from Israel, but I think that there's more going on there. Uh, Verse 4. And he will judge between the nations. He will render decisions for many peoples. Now, here we go. And they will hammer their sword shears, swords into plowshares. Forgive my New York accent. And their spears into pruning hooks. And nation will not lift up sword against nation. And never again will they learn war. I want to start singing down by the riverside at this time. So... If I were to take this literally, it would mean, of course, that people are using swords in modern warfare and that they're going to turn them into pruning shares for farming. So, I, you know, I, I, I could take that literally. I could say, well, that's what Isaiah understood as implements of war. So he probably, you know, would not be talking about uh, whatever... Uh, weapons people are going to be using to destroy one another at that time. But what does it literally mean? It literally means the end of war. So whenever the end of the end of days in this kingdom happens, the temple will be rebuilt, the law will go forth from Zion, the Gentiles will be streaming into Jerusalem, and nobody's going to be killing each other. How's that for a simple explanation? Now, if you were a supersessionist, okay, you would probably interpret it like this. The mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream into it. That's a reference to the New Testament church. There's no mountains involved here. Isaiah is just using metaphors. So this has nothing to do with the future of Israel because Israel rejected Jesus, therefore doesn't have a role in the world to come. And so many people will come in and say, come, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, may walk in his paths, for the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Zion and Jerusalem is the church. So there's no reality, physical reality to these words involving Israel because Israel is no longer part of the picture. Verse 4, and he will judge between the nations and render decisions to many peoples and they will hammer their swords into plowshares and so on and so forth. Nation will not lift up swords anymore. Well, 
That's the peace we experience in Jesus Christ, in the church, that will continue when he comes again, but it has nothing to do with Israel at all. The capstone of it, of course, is in verse 5, because that tells us who he was actually addressing. In light of all that's going to happen, come house of Jacob and let us walk in the light of the Lord. He's not speaking to the house of Jacob. He's speaking to the church, to the faithful. The supersessionists would agree with the old school traditional amillennialist who said that Abraham was the father of the Christian church. Yeah. Louis Burkhoff, page two. Okay? An old, uh, wonderful, godly, but slightly wrong theologian. <laughs> now, Let's define it a little bit. Just my own statement first. Supersessionism is on the rise today, capturing a new generation of adherents. This position asserts that the Jewish people no longer have a role in the plan of God for the ages due to their disobedience and rejection of Christ. It is the theological bedrock that undergirds the views of most evangelicals who oppose the modern state of Israel. Now, why do I throw that in? Well, besides it being true. The reason I throw that in is because, again, this is not just a lecture on supersessionism. This is a lecture on the impact of supersessionism on the Messianic Jewish movement and on Jewish missions. That's what this is all about. And so when you have supersessionists who become vitriolic in their language and rhetoric about Israel, and their treatment of Palestinians or culture. You have to rip the curtains apart to look down deep at their theology, and you will discover, for the most part, that the real problem folks have with Israel is that Israel shouldn't exist. That's really the problem. Uh, I'll show you. So, supersession and therefore, this is Mike Block, appears to be based on two core beliefs. Have you read Has, Has the Church Replaced Israel by Michael Vlock? Fantastic book. And uh, he's, he's got a real gentle spirit, unlike me. So supersessionism, therefore, appears to be based on two core beliefs. The nation of Israel has somehow completed or forfeited its status as the people of God and will never again possess a unique role or function apart from the church. And two, the church is now the true Israel that has permanently replaced or superseded national Israel as a people of God. Therefore, Isaiah chapter 2 only uh, applies to the church. Now, I would also say that would be true then of Isaiah 2, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65. And we can work our way across all the prophets. That's a theological formulation. It's not necessarily the result of biblical interpretation. The theological formulation is, since the church has replaced Israel, we glean that from the way we read the New Testament. Therefore, all of these passages in the Old Testament refer to the church. That's a theological formulation. That's leading with your theology instead of the Bible. Now, the, I believe strongly that it's really helpful to have a cohesive narrative. That the Bible, all the books of the Bible tell one story. And it's, it's, and it's a significant story and it's a complete story. And so it's good when you know the story so that you can fit things in. But there are two competing narratives out there now. One narrative has Israel in the story and one narrative takes Israel out. And uh, they're two different stories. Uh, Vlock says, supersessionism is the view that the New Testament church is the new and or true Israel that has forever superseded the national Israel as the people of God. Okay, any questions? 
No. Okay, good. Uh, now, a lot of the uh, discussion about supersessionism uh, today, because we live in an era, thank God, when Israel is, has become a modern nation, and however you view that as a fulfillment of prophecy or not, or how you nuance the fulfillment of prophecy, that's a, that's a big discussion. But be, simply because Israel is in the land, and many, many Christians say, this is because God brought them back to the land, because God gave them the land, you are all now Christian Zionists. Whether you like Christian Zionism or not, or even if you, you may have never even heard of it, okay? But you are now Christian Zionists. And so there are a group of people who are your enemies, so I, I'd like to introduce you to them. Okay? These are the anti-Christian Zionists. And the anti-Christian Zionists are quite vocal about you, whether or not you think you're a Christian Zionist or not. You could just think that you're a biblical literalist. But that's not good for these guys. They think if, if you come to the conclusion through your literal interpretation of the Bible that Israel still has a role in the plan of God, there's a future kingdom, it's Jewish in character, the Jewish people had the land by virtue of the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12, 15, 17, 22, and so on and so forth, you are a Christian Zionist, and very bad. So let me, let me at least give you a definition of Christian Zionism. First, I'll give you the good one. This is Box. Christian Zionism argues that Israel has a corporate future in God's plan and as a nation has a right to, to land in the Middle East. Israel also has a right to function as a nation and be recognized as such in the world. So that's Daryl Box's deduction. Now, on the other hand, Gary Burge, who used to teach at Wheaton College, who now teaches at uh, Calvin College in Grand Rapids, and who wrote the book Jesus and the Land, as well as quite a number of other books, is one of the leading spokespersons for the anti-Christian Zionists. And he is a proud anti-Christian Zionist. Okay? So here's what Burge says about you, if you happen to take to heart what Darrell wrote. Being Christian has a necessary political entailment. Got that? That's you, because you believe all that. We must support Israel as a nation, and this is a religious obligation. Well, it's not bad. Here's what he says. This is the view of the Christian Zionists. Their interest is less in Judaism and its preservation. It is focused instead on the unfolding of prophecy in the Middle East, and Israel is a character in the drama. Good character or bad character? Very bad. Land-grabbing monsters, in fact, because they have no right to the land, according to Birch. Now, uh, you can go read Jesus and the Land, and you'll, you'll get all the details. Or you can wait till our new book comes out, because that will be my chapter, just like you've heard everything else is everybody else's chapter. Okay. Now, supersessionism has a significant impact on Jewish evangelism and uh, our Messianic Jewish faith. So let me try and show you how. And I'm sort of summarizing the works of three authors, and you can write their names down. Gary Burge, Stephen Sizer, S-I-Z-E-R, British... Anglican theologian, and Colin Chapman. Colin Chapman is a, an evangelical Anglican long-term missionary to the Middle East who has written uh, quite a number of books about Jerusalem and about Israel. All three are supersessionists. They do not believe that the land ever belonged to the Jewish people. And if it did, it was forfeited uh, because of the rejection of Christ. Now, don't make a mistake. They all believe that Israel has a right to the land based upon uh, British and then UN mandates. It's political. So they wouldn't argue it. But it's not spiritual. The Bible never promised it to the Jewish people. Ever. Okay? And there's significance to a lot of that. But they are... Uh, 
I would like to say I, I really like all three as brothers, but I, at least I could say two out of the three. <laughs> One of them I could take, or well, I could leave. All right, so let me talk about the anti-Christian Zionist position, because if you take what you think is a literal view of the Bible and believe it, in a future for Israel, and you put Jewish people in the narrative, then you are this. So you may as well know what they're saying about you. So uh, the new anti-Christian Zionists are generally supersessionist in theology. Now you've all heard of Christ at the Checkpoint. How many of you have heard of Christ at the Checkpoint? Okay. That's sponsored by Bethlehem Bible College, and um, the new one's coming up soon. Michael Brown is speaking, and uh, it's coming up soon. And this is basically uh, an effort by our Palestinian brothers and sisters, who I believe take a, uh, feel a, a, more of a warmth towards the uh, anti-Israel Palestinian position. Uh, what you have to understand is that in this conference, underlying it, there'll be all sorts of dis discussions, and you can watch some of it. It's online. You can watch it. But in general, I know them. They're supersession, every one of them. They do not believe Israel has land. Yeah. What is the term for that conference again? Christ at the checkpoint. Checkpoint. Yes, it's not Christ at the check mark. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I've got a good one for you. Here's here's how this works. So I'm friends with a, a Korean brother who's a pastor in northern New Jersey. In a very Jewish neighborhood, Bergen County. And so he's, he's a pastor. And um, uh, I now, we went to Korea together. I now speak at his church, you know, and, and he's got Jewish believers at a Korean church. And, uh, and you know, he's just wonderful, wonderful. And, and he, they have prayer meetings for the Jewish people, just this typical Korean Christian fervor, you know. I don't know if you ever pray with a group of Koreans. I, I feel so carnal all the time. You know? <laughs> and, but, but he's a great guy. And, uh, and I never thought to ask him. So one day we're sitting at lunch, and he said, uh, yeah, and we were eating kimchi, not bagels and lox. And <laughs> he, said, he said, you know, I wasn't raised this way, to, the way I feel about Israel. I said, yeah, I never thought to even ask you. He says, oh, no, no. I was raised as such a supersessionist that I didn't even know I was a supersessionist. It was nothing that I ever chose. It was simply the way I read the Bible. I said, wow, so what happened? He said, well, one day, and he's not the spookiest Christian in the world. You know, he's kind of normal. He was Presbyterian, you know. And, and so he said, I was doing my devotions, and the Lord spoke to me clearly. And as I was reading the Old Testament, and he just said, that's really Israel, not the church. And he said, I, I couldn't believe God told me that, and, but in a flash, I understood it. I had been interpreted every time the Old Testament mentioned Israel, I thought of the church every time, the, except in the judgment parts. And in the New Testament, every time Israel was mentioned, I thought it was the church, the Israel of God. But now I realize that God was, the Bible was speaking about ethnic Israel, national Israel. The promises were to national Israel, not just the, the bad ones, the good ones too. And they were physical, they were literal, they involved the land, not, not just an allegorical, spiritualized, you know, uh, church. It was, it was real. I said, well, that must have been a shocker. He says, oh, I had to repent for weeks. I said, what, what did you do? After that, he said, well, I had to go before my church. And I repented before my church. And I told the church that if they want me to resign, I was willing to resign. And uh, I said, so did you rebuild the church? He said, no, not really. Uh, I told the church to pray about it and came back next Sunday and everybody else repented. <laughs> we lost a few, but mostly everybody repented. And, 
So, is it educational? It's educational in the same way that I was taught that Jews don't believe in Jesus. Never had a course in it. I don't remember my mother ever saying anything. All I know is that was my viewpoint on life. Did I grow up thinking Christians hated Jews? Of course I did. Did anybody sit down and say, now remember, bitch, Christians hate Jews. I don't remember anybody ever saying that. It just happens. Just culture. Now, the new anti-Christian Zionists do not believe that the Jewish people have a biblical right to the land of Israel. They do believe we have a, public, a political right, but not a biblical right. The new anti-Christian Zionists generally believe that all efforts to return the land of Israel to Jewish hands are immoral and illegitimate, but not necessarily illegal. We have a legal right to the land, but what we're doing is totally wrong and immoral. We stole land. So, you know, you may have gotten the right to it, and you might have a legal right to it, but you shouldn't take it, because it's immoral, you know. Now, when it comes to the territories, whoo, boy, oh boy, you know. You know somebody is an anti-Christian Zionist and probably a supersessionist if they use, if they're a Christian, they use the term occupied territories. Okay, that's a buzzword. That should set the bells off, okay. They're constantly talking about the occupied uh, territories. Okay. Um, next, the new Christian, anti, new anti-Christian Zionists assert that modern Israel's right to exist was determined by UN resolution, but Jewish-Israeli efforts to expand the 48 beyond the 48 borders are politically illegitimate, including the uniting of Jerusalem. All land by, absorbed by Israel since that time should be returned to its rightful Palestinian owners. Not the first time you've heard that. But that is the consistent worldview of the anti-Christian Zionists. Why? Because Glazer's telling you they don't believe that Israel should ever have the land. Not the occupied territories, not the non-occupied territories, nothing. We stole all of it from the Palestinians. We got it, and, and the British should be shot for it. And the UN, well, we might agree on the UN, but, and so, you know, there's no, you know, because of the underlying quicksand, because there's no theological commitment or understanding that the Jewish people have a right to the land based upon God's promises to the fathers. Because of that, when things are not politically clear, they don't know what to say they can only say that it's not right. So for example, the argument that people throw out, well, wait a minute, that was a, it, was a, it was a war. We didn't declare the 67 war. That wasn't us. And besides, look, 73 war, we took the Sinai, we gave it back, which was smart, it's just desert, you know? <laughs> but the Golan, have you ever been on the Golan Heights? Hey, if I was a Syrian tank commander, I would love the Golan Heights. You know, just nice and flat, you know, right down into Tiberias, right down Highway 6. You know, I could, I could attack the whole country, you know, within three or four hours. You think Israel's going to give up the Golan Heights? We, we, we won the war. Okay? And what about East Jerusalem? <laughs> yeah, right. You think, who's going to give who? East Jerusalem, right? Now, admittedly, it does have the best hummus in the whole country. Okay? So it is worth holding on to. But Jewish people, what do you, you think Jewish? Well, oh, yeah, take the wall. Who needs it? Can't build on it anyway. You know, or the Temple Mount, too much hassle. You have to understand, Jewish people are not going to do that. Um, and you saw what happened when we tried giving Gaza back. Talk about a disaster. Now we'll see what happens with a unified Palestinian Authority and Hamas government. That just happened about three days ago. And we'll see what the implications of that is going to be. The simple fact is this. Even if Israel won the right 
fair and square in a war to have that territory. The anti-supersessionists does not believe Israel has a right to it because they don't have a biblical right and they don't have a political right because it wasn't part of the mandate. It wasn't part of the 48 boundaries. And so everything Israel does regarding the territories is morally wrong. Everything. Can't do right. The new anti-Christian Zionists generally believe that evangelical Christians who affirm Israel's right to the land, particularly you North Americans, are right-wing and have syncretized their pro-American and pro-Israel positions and are aggressively pro-Israel and anti-Palestinian. That, uh, well, you're, an, you're a Christian Zionist, okay? You don't like this description, do you? That's, that's how you're thought of, though, okay? Um, well, there's a lot of things wrong in there, yeah. The new anti-Christian Zionists believe that evangelicals who are pro-Israel are all extreme dispensationalists and have a sensationalistic view of end-time prophecy. Generally, that's the way people look at, look at it. And uh, how many of you still have the late great planet Earth next to your bedside? Okay. <laughs> okay. How many of you believe that in the book of Revelation that the locusts really are a new form of attack helicopters developed by the U.S. Army? Okay. All right. So, you know, Hal Lindsey did his best. You know, it's always difficult to interpret ancient prophecies in modern terms, and so on. But basically, everything we believe, just, the, just because we believe literally that God gave the land to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, just because we believe this, we're a bunch of nuts. We are a marginalized, eccentric group of nuts. Just so you know. And that comes across in all the literature uh, of the anti-Christian Zionists. The new anti-Christian Zionists believe that the premillennial and especially dispensational positions which affirm the right of Jewish people to the land of Israel are new to church history and therefore should be viewed as the recent and eccentric teachings of a, marginalized, of a marginal group. Well, you know, there's a lot to learn here. Uh, basically, they write it all off to uh, J.N. Darby, a Plymouth Brethren, uh, minister in England who allegedly coined the word in the late 1700s. And so they all say that this is new when, okay, we admit that uh, before, the, before there was an English language, there was no dispensationalism. But to believe that the church never believed in a literal right of the Jewish people to the land of Israel and that this is an invention of 200 years ago, an eccentric to boot, means you haven't studied church history. So I got Mike Vlock in our new book to write an entire chapter on the view of the land belonging to the Jewish people from the vantage point of the church fathers starting in the second century. And it's a great chapter. I've read it. It's fantastic. And so... It's, it's just patently false, okay? And it's a silly argument. The new anti-Christian Zionists believe that the pro-Israel Zionist perspective of the conservative and fundamental evangelical church in North America has hurt the cause of evangelization among Muslims. Well, there's truth to that. To that. Well, if I'm going to say that the supersessionism of historic Christians, which has led to the, some of the really bad writings of Martin Luther and others has negatively influenced the church when it comes to Jewish people and Jewish evangelism, I think it's fair to admit that some of the things that the church has said regarding, you know, every Muslim a terrorist and all these other kinds of things that we're saying, that's pretty prevalent. And because, you know, North Americans are met. Listen, I lived in New York. I experienced 9-11. I wasn't happy. Okay, really wasn't happy, okay? especially when uh, there was a huge uh, mosque and uh, Islamic center right near where my girls were going to school uh, on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and uh, this imam, K 
came out right after 9-11 and said that it was the Jews' fault and the Mossad was involved with the fall of the towers. Okay? Next thing you know, he's gone. Nobody even knows where he is. He didn't stay. Okay? So, yeah, I mean, there are certain things, there are ridiculous things that make you upset, but has the pro-Israel position of the church, and maybe sometimes, see, it's not the pro-Israel position of the church, it's been the anti-Muslim position of the church, just like the anti-Jewish position of the church, okay? Jesus died for everybody, right? Call me a bleeding heart liberal, I am a New Yorker, okay? You know, but for heaven's sake, you know, Christians need to watch their rhetoric. Okay? If we create a climate of antagonism and we depict people as evil, then make no bones about it. People will not want to reach them for Christ. And, and we need to create a, a realistic climate that encourages people to share the gospel with, with others. Yes. Uh, on the other side of things, what we're seeing today is to be relevant, I have to conform my beliefs to a certain thing, and that will win people to Christ. And, and that's not the role of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and that's nonsense. Yeah. Right, Craig? That's nonsense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll, I mean, we'll deal a little bit with moral equivalence. Uh, that's a value of the world. Everybody's the same. Everything's the same. Everything's as wrong as anything else. I mean, every, you know, there's. It's a very boring world to want to be. I don't know why certain people would want to live in a world like that. It's very boring, you know. But no, this, we're not talking about uh, moral equivalence here. The only equivalence we're saying is when you talk harshly about a race, a race of people or an ethnic group and people listen to you or read your tweets, then people are going to not like that group. You know, it's harder to pray for people you hate, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. Um, I think on our basic level, anything we think or believe, there's an element of what's in it for me. Yes. So let's say you have, I think there probably are a lot of supersessionists that are just that because they don't know any better or just haven't figured, thought about it. But then those who are actually choosing it to say, I'm going to believe this, what's in it for them? Especially if they're just podunk Texas and never going to be in the Middle East, never going to have anything to do with the Middle East or Israel. What's in it for them to be that? I don't know because I'm not one. <laughs> um, I, really, I really don't know what, what's, what's in it for them. I think, I think that maybe spans the ages. I think that uh, the, what's in it for them is feeling that they're doing the right thing. Um, I think probably that's the major thing. I'll, I'll show you. There's a few other things here that might point to it. Um, a pro-Israel position is anti-Palestinian by nature. Really? You believe that? I don't believe that. Uh, I wish Tom Doyle was here. Tom was going to do this with me, but had to get out of Dodge. And uh, so Tom just sent me a picture of one of the Palestinian guys that he's helping to disciple in uh, Nazareth. And uh, on, his, on his left arm, uh, he has tattooed the Shema. And what Tom would say, since Tom is not here, I can say it, and poor Tom, what Tom would say is all his experience in the Middle East among Muslims, he would say, among, among uh, Arabs, he would say, the, the former Muslims, when they get saved, they're radically transformed and tend to believe that the land belongs to the Jewish people and take the fallout for it. They love, the, they love the Jewish people. It's a lot of the folks who were raised in more historic Christian churches that have a harder time coming to grips with uh, Israel. And, 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 you know, and Tom and I have 
gone back and forth on that one. He doesn't have, he has anecdotal evidence, not really a survey yet. But what's interesting about it is uh, I, my field is uh, mission history, so I look a lot at Jewish mission history and the history of revivals and outpourings of the Spirit. And, and there are a few things that happen. When somebody's radically transformed or when a, a, a society or a city or a nation is transformed, um, people do tend to go back to reading the Bible more literally, and if you do that, it's not encumbered by a lot of theological systems. So when you go back and read the Bible more literally, you tend to have a favorable view of Israel and the Jewish people. It also produces new music. It also produces evangelism. It, produ it produces new leaders. I mean, there's a lot of things that are telltale signs of a moving of the Holy Spirit. But one of those is a literal view of the Bible with an interest in Israel. Almost every outpouring of the Spirit for, for years, time, for years, including the early uh, post-reformers, there's always been a positive attitude towards Israel and the Jewish people. Tom? I have a Christian Arab friend in Bethlehem and East Jerusalem, and his experience is the same as what Tom brought up. Every Muslim that he leads to the Lord and they study the scriptures with him doesn't have an anti-Israel view. They, right. And ones that struggle with it, they said, I can learn to love them because this is the word of God and Paul was a Jew, and he seemed to love everybody. Right. It, it's an interesting phenomenon, but I'd I, I would love to see a survey, but that'd be a hard, hard survey to take. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, like, with all this information, I've had a couple of really good conversations with college students who are leaning towards super cessationism in the United States. Super sessionism. Yeah. A literal, a literal reading of Genesis 12, 1 through 3. So is that a good place to That's start? a great place to start. It's an excellent question. Genesis 12, 1 through 3, the Abrahamic covenant, and then Genesis 15, really the whole chapter, but particularly near the end, after the uh, God puts Abram asleep, cuts the animal, remember, cuts the animals in half, and then the torch and the uh, pot come, come through. It's basically an image of God walking through the cut animals. Uh, that's, that shows that, that the kind of covenant that was made is totally unconditional. It depends upon God walking through, and it's irreversible because you can't reconnect the bodies. Okay? So it's a powerful covenant. And at the end of the statement of that vision uh, of Abraham, a dream, at the end of it, God gives Abram the boundaries of the land of Israel, which we've never achieved yet. But in this Isaiah 2 kingdom, we will. But, so that's, that's a good place to start, in my opinion. Okay, just a few more. The new anti-Christian Zionists often utilize the rhetoric and argumentation of the Palestinian narrative and express the viewpoint of the Palestinian media. It's a very serious uh, issue. Um, have you ever read the Kairos document? K-A-I-R-O-S. Kairos document it's an interesting document. It was developed by Palestinian evangelicals based upon a similar document that was developed by a group of Christians in South Africa as a response to apartheid. And oftentimes, my Palestinian brothers and sisters will accuse those of us who believe that Israel has a right to the land of apartheid. There's, there's no difference between apartheid and what we're doing to the Palestinians with the Bethlehem Wall and the security wall and everything else. My only response to that is, obviously, you never visited South Africa during apartheid, which I did. It's ludicrous, being honest with you. It's just totally ridiculous. You know? Argument number one, um, there are Palestinian members of Knesset. You know, I'm just, just beginning there. I mean, they obviously don't know what apartheid is, you know. So how do you argue against something like that? Actually, uh, the argument saying that it was similar to apartheid was developed by an extraordinarily liberal left-wing Israeli and then embraced by the uh, Palestinians. 
Okay. The major opponents of the new anti-Christian Zionism are usually pro-Palestinian Western Europeans, major proponents, I, I said opponents, of the new anti-Christian Zionism are usually pro-Palestinian Western Europeans and American evangelicals who are often left to center in their politics from a British and U.S. perspective. I'm, not, I'm just saying that. That is not a condemnation of anybody's politics. I'm just saying that, this, that a pro-Palestinian perspective usually goes along with a left-wing political agenda. That's all I'm saying. The new anti-Christian Zionists were in many cases either short or long, and this is a part answer to your question. The new anti-Christian Zionists were in many cases either short-term or long-term missionaries to the Mid Middle East, two of all three of our authors that I mentioned, and greatly sympathized with their cause. One of the greatest gifts missionaries have is empathy, able to see life and feel things that your constituency feel and think. And uh, it's, an, uh, it's an extraordinary gift among missionaries. And uh, these, they become like their people. It, it's to be expected. So uh, this is understandable as missionaries tend to be more empathetic towards those whom God calls them to reach. So it, it is true. And, and actually, a lot of the pro-Palestinian Western evangelicals, and when I say pro-Palestinian, I mean pro a thick Palestinian political agenda, okay? You know, we're all pro-Palestinian, pro-Arab, we're pro-everybody, right? Last time I checked, Jesus died for us all. So, I mean, that's, that's not the discussion. You, you got that part? I don't want anybody to not get that part, okay? Uh, okay, let me go on. Just real quickly, and then I'll close. The direct impact of supersessionism on Jewish evangelism. <laughs> supersessionism annuls Jewish identity. This is problematic. <laughs> it goes like this. You can be Jewish and believe in Jesus. You really can. Okay, I believe in Jesus. Fantastic. When I said you, you could be Jewish and believe in Jesus, I meant you could still like matzo ball soup, and, but, but you know, there's no, nothing else. I mean, no theological chosenness, all that stuff is gone, right? You understand that. So you're a Jew, but you're a Jew like an Italian's an Italian. There's no covenants, there's no obligations. And when Paul was referring to the remnant in Romans 11:5, he was speaking about the church. True. The church. There's a remnant according to the election of grace. Not Israel. You know. Okay. So supersessionism annuls Jewish identity. That means if you're Jewish, you believe in Jesus, you check your yarmulke at the door before you walk into the church. This is not positive for us. Secondly, supersessionism robs the Jewish people of the hope of Zion, one of the most important pieces of the fabric of Jewish existence and worldview. Uh, so I was talking to one of my uh, Lubavitch Hasidim, Chabad, you know them? Speaking to one of my friends. And uh, he says, what do you call yourself? I said, Messianic Jew. He says, but I'm Messianic. I said, that's true. We're both Messianic. We just have different messiahs, probably. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so this, is, this cherished hope for religious Jewish people, leaning towards the Orthodox side, who believe in a, a personal messiah who will come and and uh, save the Jewish people and establish God's kingdom, we have a very similar hope. Only our hope, of course, is to Yeshua's second coming. It's to the first coming of, only coming, of our, our Jewish friends. But, if, but the, Jewish, the Jewish hope of Zion and the return to Zion is it's in all of our literature. It's in all of our poetry. It's all over our synagogue service. At the end of Passover, we say, L'shana habab Yerushalayim, next year, we will be in Jerusalem, and you're telling me that none of this is true. You're, you're destroying who I am. It's serious. This is really also important. Supersessionism deliteralizes the Old Testament. 
For example, how can Jesus be the fulfillment of prophecy in his first coming when the details of his second coming are not taken literally? If the future Jerusalem is not the real city, then how can we be sure that Bethlehem was the real Bethlehem? Got that? Can't have it both ways. Supersessionism, when combined with politics, creates a negative attitude toward Israel and the Jewish people. That's pretty bad. And that's impacting us in Jewish missions when we try and recruit short-term workers, when we try and recruit staff, when we try and get young people on college campuses to volunteer with us to reach their Jewish friends. You know, would you like to reach the Jewish friends on your campus? Uh, Sure. How do you feel about Palestinians? Can we reach the Palestinians too? I said, what? well, we're reaching Jewish people. Yeah, but we, we have to show that we don't hate the Palestinians. I said, well, I don't hate Palestinians. You know, it goes on and on and on. It's, it's really messing things up. And I think that as Christians, we are our brother's keepers and we're responsible for our words. What we say and what we write. And I'm trying to be responsible as I speak. And so... A negative rhetoric towards Israel will make the uninformed, innocent, and those who look to you for guidance feel the same way about Israel without any of your restraint or any of your more mature understanding of the situation. And so we can really mess things up by doing that. Supersessionism hurts Jewish evangelism. As no, there's no longer any theological motivation for reaching Jewish people with the gospel other than their need to be saved. You see, the greatest argument theologically for Jewish evangelism that has worked for centuries in missions to the Jews have understood this argument and used it to inspire Gentile Christians to reach Jewish people for hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of years. And like the word of God, the argument never changes. And that is, when the Jewish people turn to Christ, Allah Romans 11, then Yeshua will return. If you want to participate in the second coming of the Lord, then let's get out there and reach Jewish people for the Messiah. And brothers and sisters, that is true. It is all through scripture. When the Jewish people repent, then Yeshua will return. And the Jewish people will then become what God always wanted the Jewish people to be. Isaiah 2 will happen in 3D, 4D, 5D, 5D. It will all happen when the Jewish people say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Lord comes. Take that argument away. We're 14 million among 5 billion. And... There's just no need to reach the Jewish people, which I think is exactly Satan's goal. He's not very smart, and he's definitely not omniscient. And he doesn't understand that he can't stop God's plan. He can't. But what we're experiencing now is that God's going to just have to override the church again <laughs> in order to get done what he needs to get done. But wouldn't it be much better and a greater joy if we were to participate with God and bring the gospel to the Jewish people to the end that the promise of God to Abram will come to pass and through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. All right, I'll be around for a few questions, but then I have to run downstairs and teach you again. So let's pray. Abba, thank you for your goodness and love. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. Help us to be faithful to it in every way. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and we pray for those who uh, oppose the peace of Jerusalem. We pray that no matter who they are, you might turn their hearts and uh, reign uh, on the throne of their life. And Lord, we just know that when you're in charge of their life, that they will have soft and tender hearts to Jerusalem. And Lord, we pray for that in the great name of Yeshua. Amen. Thank you.